Today's lecture is going to focus on avian conservation. So we're going to take the information that we learned from population ecology and um, life history strategies and nesting biology to, to try to really understand habitat use, to try to understand why certain birds um, uh, are threatened or endangered uh, as their current status or their populations are declining and what we can do to um, um, help these species out um, and uh, get them back to a more stable population size. And uh, this is one of the species we'll be talking about. This is the golden-cheeked warbler. Uh, you can see its distribution. It, um, in the U.S., um, is restricted to Texas. Um, there may be some southern uh, Oklahoma. I don't think so with this species. I know the um, um, black cat vireo has a very similar range. Um, primarily Texas as far as the U.S. goes. It does extend a little bit into um, uh, southern Oklahoma as well. Um, but this really is you know, a Texas bird. And um, one of the things I mentioned briefly about avian conservation is a lot of it is um, politics, uh, a lot of it is advertising, and I really think that this species should be renamed. Um, we have precedents of other warblers, uh, some of which are, are passing through Nacogdoches right now. Um, we have Tennessee warblers. Um, so there are other states that have um, warblers uh, named after them. Um, there's even a um, so there's a, a Tennessee warbler, there's even a Nashville warbler. So even the city of Nashville um, has a, a warbler. So um, I, I think people, Texans are very proud of everything Texas. And so I think it could uh, be a big boost to uh, conservation efforts for this species by renaming it the Texas warbler. Uh, so uh, write the governor. All right. When it comes to um, conservation biology, birds actually are a very good tool. Um, birds are great biological indicators. We're going to see that instead of just focusing on the conservation of a single species, um, if you can, uh, what it really boils down to in many cases is a lack of habitat or habitat degradation. And birds are great biological indicators of the quality of a habitat and the health of, of a, a community and ecosystem. And the great thing about birds is most of them are diurnal. Um, they're relatively easy to identify, and so uh, data collection is fairly easy. And one of the things I've been driving home this semester is the importance of learning how to identify them by sight, but also by sound. Um, in the breeding season, the, the singing is easily the best way that you can identify most of the birds that are in an area because you're just not going to see them. And unfortunately, because of the coronavirus and, and the inability of us to have classes together um, has really driven this home. Um, I've noticed that uh, there's so many birds out there that you're, in your weekly reports are not identifying because you don't know what their vocalization is and, and I can I understand that that's a difficult thing to do and I wish I was there to, to teach it to you um, but it is a skill that that I hope you've started to develop and, and can, can continue uh, to uh, fine-tune so birds are easy to collect data for and they really are representative of, of the ecology uh, and the, the, the quality of the conditions of an area and uh, again, one of the conservation strategies now, instead of focusing on a single species, is if you focus on a habitat and restore a habitat to quality, you're actually helping many species, which uh, oftentimes uh, have uh, small populations and are either threatened or endangered. Well, some species, uh, it's too late. Um, there are uh, approximately 131 species that have gone extinct uh, since the 1600s, so in historic times, um, and most of this has been focused on islands. 90% of these extinction events have occurred on islands. So one of the uh, classic examples, this is the dodo of the Mauritius Island. Um, the dodo um, is was a columbiform, so it was a, basically a big 
Dove, and it uh, had, was adapted for living on an island in which um, weather extremes could be very uh, common, uh, resource availability could vary quite a bit, and so a, an adaptive strategy to live in an environment like that is to get big and plump so that you have fat stores to make it through lean times. And again, most birds don't do that because they can fly, but if you're on an island and you don't have predators, then you don't need uh, to fly, and so they have secondarily, they had secondarily lost the capability of flying, and instead adapted this morphology of uh, evolve this adaptive morphology of just being big and chunky um, so that you can make it through these lean times. Well, introduce Portuguese and Dutch uh, and English sailors. Um, they would uh, arrive uh, on the island, capture these birds, literally waddle them up uh, onto their boats because they found that they could go a long time on the boats uh, as they continued their cruise um, before they would die. So basically, they would eat them as they died or as, as needed. And so because you don't have refrigeration, um, this was a, a good a meat uh, option for these sailors. And unfortunately, the birds didn't have any natural fear of humans, so they were very easy to capture, and hence the, the term the dodo. Um, the North Atlantic Islands used to have a species called the great auk which was also a flightless bird. Um, and its uh, extinction was uh, due to, um, again, uh, human predation. In, in this case, it was uh, as much the eggs that were uh, stolen by humans as it was killing of, of the adults. New Zealand, big island, but it is an island. Um, the moas uh, went extinct in, in historic time frame uh, because of human hunting pressure. And the same thing for the elephant birded of Madagascar and um, various number of, of species of seabirds uh, on Easter Island. Easter Island has a very interesting history of resource use and, and misuse, I should say. Um, there's a book by Jared Diamond. Um, I think it's, he's written several really good books. I think it's Guns, Germs, and Steel, where he talks about the habitat degradation of Easter Island um, with increasing human populations and they basically cut down all the forests, um, ate basically all the living things that are on the island and, and starvation was a big problem uh, and they basically uh, over hunted uh, the seabirds that were uh, nesting on the island and, and uh, collected their eggs and so forth. And so it led to the extinction of, of many of these species already previously mentioned the problem of, of the lowland pass rains in the Hawaiian Island, most of those dying out because of avian malaria after uh, Western uh, Westerners arrived and brought that disease with the mosquitoes, the Anopheles mosquito. Um, but there is evidence that many of the lowland pass rains had also gone extinct prior to that by the native Hawaiians who used them, who collected them for food, but also for ceremonial cloaks that the, the royalty would have. Um, the Bishop Museum in, in Hawaii has some great examples of these cloaks covered with these teeny tiny uh, covert feathers, these massive uh, cloaks um, that, that took just hundreds and hundreds of birds to, to complete likely and that uh, pressure um, led to the extinction of some of the pass rains before the Westerners even introduced malaria. Guam, um, Guam is just a disaster. Um, Guam had the introduction of a snake called the brown snake and it, uh, this was a, Guam didn't have any snakes previous to this and so the birds there did not have any natural um, behavioral adaptations uh, against predation by these snakes and these snakes are incredibly um, fecund um, and excellent predators and so they have basically uh, led to the extinction of most of the species of birds uh, on Guam and apparently Guam is if you're afraid of spiders don't go to Guam because with the removal of so many insectivorous birds the spider populations have just gone crazy 
uh, and there are just spider webs everywhere. So, um, like I pointed out with regard to the golden cheek warbler, one, and we, we talked about when we talked about population biology, um, one of the issues with a species of concern oftentimes is they have very small geographic ranges, um, oftentimes associated with very specific, uh, narrow uh, habitat uh, availability or, or preferences that, that, that lead them to be very habitat specific. Uh, and that's the case of the Kirtland's warbler, uh, which you can see um, nesting in, in a, just a few places in uh, the Great Lakes area where they uh, live in jack pine um, habitat that has to be burned at a very regular uh, uh, ratio. It has to have large patches because otherwise we'll talk about the problem with forest fragmentation. Brown-headed cowbirds uh, tend to uh, be brood parasites of, of Kirtland's warblers to a high degree in very fragmented habitats and so that's that's something that has to be addressed. But that's just talking about the breeding ground. Remember, for migrant species, you also have to worry about the quality of the wintering habitat in the Caribbean, um, and then uh, are there adequate stopover areas for Kirtland's warblers to make that annual migration uh, twice. A little more about the golden cheek warbler. Um, it is a habitat specialist. It, it requires scrub oak habitat with mature 50 to 80 year old ash junipers. The, the junipers they have these kind of flaky barks that the, the birds will take that, that flakiness uh, off of the barks as uh, a major part of their nest. Uh, so yeah, I do say that they do uh, occupy you know a little bit of southern Oklahoma, but primarily they are a central Texas bird. And um, again, I, I just think that they should be called the Texas warp. So, um, as I've mentioned several times, habitat loss and habitat degradation are the, the, the main reasons why endangered species are where they are. Um, it, it, it is the primary factor affecting uh, population declines in most of these species and the inability for them to recover without um, some modification of the habitat or an increase in the amount of habitat. So, uh, locally, We've got uh, the example is the red cockaded woodpecker, which uh, uses, uh, which requires a mature pine forest. Um, I mean, they prefer old growth, but just uh, that's a very rare. So the older the forest with larger diameter trees, the better. They tend to prefer longleaf pines, uh, but they will use um, loblolly shortleaf uh, pine habitats. But in all these mature forests, they have to have an open understory. So they do not like a, a midstory, um, and they do not like a very brushy understory. They like a nice, open, grassy, it's oftentimes referred to as a pine savanna. And we'll talk about the importance of fire for maintaining that, that habitat. Similarly, uh, spotted owls uh, per, uh, require old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest. I've already mentioned the, the Kirtland's warblers uh, requiring the jack pine uh, habitat. Uh, in Michigan and, and uh, other areas of the Great Lakes. For the scrub jay, we've talked about them as a cooperative species, and uh, one of the contributing factors to them being cooperative is their reliance on frequently burned oak scrub habitats in central Florida. Um, in general, if you talk, talk about it from a community standpoint, there's been studies that have indicated that uh, deer populations, when they get too big in the southeastern part of the U.S., can cause a major decline uh, in the quality of the habitat of ground nesting forest birds because it, it removes the vegetation cover that they need to uh, camouflage their nests, and so they suffer higher uh, predation rates. And there's even evidence that the deer themselves um, will actually eat nestlings um, and destroy the nests themselves, which is was kind of a surprise until cameras uh, at nest started uh, documenting these patterns. Rails, waterfowl, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this uh, being associated with just loss of wetland uh, habitat. Uh, the amount of wetlands that was uh, in the U.S. Um, prior to European settle settlement 
and the loss of that has been uh, drastic. Uh, and then, of course, that's going to lead to great declines in these, these populations. Um, and then again, for migrants, we've already talked uh, a lot about the, the difficulty in maintaining uh, habitat in three different areas uh, to, to allow their migratory behavior to proceed. And bre breeding ground, stopover sites, and, and the wintering ground. So, um, again, it's it oftentimes centers on habitat. And so, if you're doing something for these habitat specialist species, if you're maintaining the habitat for them, oftentimes that's associated with a long evolutionary history of, of being uh, living in that habitat of that quality. So if you can uh, maintain the habitat for the specialist species, you're really going to be helping out numerous other species that may have slight less um, uh, habitat specificity with regard to what characteristics of the habitat. Uh, they need. And so that, that really is the new adaptive strategy is maintaining habitats. Speaking of which, one of which is conservation of wetlands. Um, so um, preserving the wetlands that we have, but then also creating artificial wetlands that have uh, uh, the right depths and uh, draw off periods where they dry to allow um, aquatic vegetation to grow and then filling patterns that mimic uh, the natural processes that would have occurred in, in more natural wetlands. And this has led to great um, cooperation between countries, between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, for uh, uh, helping uh, to track populations of waterfowl that are important for uh, hunting. Um, and so there's also been a great deal of, of research on tracking these populations um, to uh, understand their dynamics associated with habitat, but also hunting pressure so that you can regulate the populations um, in an effective way to change hunting regulations year to year, depending on the population uh, estimates. And not only has this led to cooperation between um, countries, but uh, different uh, non-governmental organizations like Ducks Unlimited for their, their interest in hunting primarily um, for these, these populations. But then also um, the Nature Conservancy, which uh, is focused on uh, preservation of habitat, and the Audubon Society, which is interested in birds not necessarily for hunting, but um, for just uh, bird watching. And so it's led to some strange partnerships between individuals. Uh, they all want these populations to increase, but for different reasons. So the Audubon Society, the, those members may be just as interested in the ducks, but, but but just identify them. But they'd also be interested in a wetland because it's going to have more red and blackbirds and common yellow throats and probably some chats around the area, um, marsh wrens. Um, so um, everybody's winning uh, in these collaborations. Wood duck is a uh, waterfowl species that almost went extinct in, around 1900. But hunting restrictions and population regulation led to a huge rebound uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, 1930s, they had a healthy populations already. And now, um, this, uh, by looking at breeding bird surveys and Christmas bird counts, you can see that, that this species is actually uh, even expanding its range. So that's a success story. Um, you probably grew up, one of the things that you was almost synonymous with conservation biology was uh, saving tropical forests. And um, by no means is that the only conservation issue, but the reason why it is so uh, upfront in the public is the biodiversity that's associated with this. So it, there's only about 7% of land cover that is tropical forest, but it actually houses 66% of species. So biodiversity-wise, um, tropical forest is where it's at. Um, and if you're going to get bang for your buck, preserving, say, an X amount of habitat uh, for X amount of money, um, you're getting more biodiversity uh, saved, more genetic diversity saved by saving tropical forests. So that's why oftentimes you hear that as, as a focus. And the loss uh, is great. So these are... These data are old from an old textbook, but it just kind of demonstrates the issue. So about 50 million acres lost per year. Um, 
this figure here shows the historic range of um, uh, what was available in the 1980s, uh, the gray. Uh, the dark areas are forests that have been lost or degraded to the point that they are no longer functional um, uh, forest patches. And one of these that is the most endangered is uh, seen down here on the southeastern uh, corner of Brazil and South America, uh, other countries in South America down a little bit farther, uh, Argentina. Um, this is the uh, southern coastal uh, forest and th there is a huge amount of biodiversity that is being lost because you can see it is only remaining in very, very few uh, patches. One of my former graduate students, Matt Buckingham, uh, did some research on this trying to understand what remaining patches, uh, what forest characteristics of those remaining patches indicated good quality versus uh, lower quality habitat to maintain biodiversity. And one of the things that is um, seen quite commonly is regarding um, not just forest loss or habitat loss, but um, habitat quality degradation is a, a, a pattern called habitat fragmentation. So what habitat fragmentation does is it, is it uh, means instead of having one big chunk of habitat, you have broken up remaining habitat into little islands. Uh, and these small habitat patches obviously can contain fewer individuals. And so they tend to have uh, less rich communities. We talked about that in the previous lecture. And they suffer from what's called an edge effect. So um, again, think about something that's like uh, like a pizza. Okay, so a, a small pizza, um, it has relatively little interior, but it's got a lot of surface area relative to that interior uh, on on the edge. The bigger and the bigger that round pizza gets the greater the ratio of the interior with less relative edge. So as a patch, same thing with a, a, a habitat patch, as it gets smaller and smaller, um, you end up getting more relative edge. This makes it easier for exotic species oftentimes to um, uh, enter those communities. It leads to increased predation of edge specialist species like a lot of meso predators. Um, skunks, raccoons, um, and it, gra it, it, in it drastically increases uh, brood parasitism rates by species like brown-headed cowbirds. So these small habitat patches may have good characteristics with regard to habitat structure and uh, tree and, and uh, brush and, and grass, uh, you know, plant basic uh, plant material that might define the, the habitat quality. But because of this edge and these factors that I mentioned above, it greatly reduces the quality of these habitats. And here's a study that demonstrated this looking in Missouri, comparing forest patches uh, as seen here on the right, and the dark is, is con more contiguous forest. Here you can see many more islands of habitat with lots of surface area uh, with very little volume. And here is the effect of this. This is some data. Sorry, my Carolina runs back. This is the data that, that demonstrates um, the how bad edge effect can be. All right. So um, this study demonstrated two basic things. One is that the the nest uh, parasitism rate by brown-headed cowbird uh, was much higher in um, small forested patches. So the, depending on the, the percentage of the landscape that was forested, if it was little, that means very small uh, habitat patches of forest, more contiguous forest had much lower brown-headed cowbird uh, parasitism rate. And this is comparing four different species. The indigo buntings, which are very common here in Nacogdoches now, worm-eating warblers, Kentucky warblers, we've got quite a few Kentucky warblers, so if you head out to, say, um, parts of, right along the river, I heard some uh, along the tram road, uh, which we went to with, with a lab. So you can hear Kentucky warblers there. You can also hear them out at the uh, experimental forest. Uh, 
in oven birds. So these four species all show that pattern, the, the edge effect with regard to a nest parasitism by brown and cowbirds. But just overall uh, nest predation rates, uh, loss of nest, shows the same pattern for all of these species. More contiguous forests, less likely to be depredated on a daily basis, a lower probability, a relatively high probability of nest predation on a daily basis if it's a small habitat patch. So, what does it take to restore habitat? Uh, to, well, one thing is just make larger habitats, uh, reduces edge effect, that's, that's one thing. Um, but, but how do you actually get a habitat to increase in quality? Um, here's a, a study that demonstrates how quickly and how effective this can be with native grasslands. So this was a study in Maryland where they uh, converted croplands to native grasslands. And here's the reason why the, the study was initiated. So this was um, data for grasshopper sparrows. And you see that back in the 60s and 70s, there was a fairly uh, healthy population of those that showed a very uh, steep decline into uh, um, the 2000s in which uh, the birds were very rare in this uh, uh, cropland habitat. The other thing about that, though, is, is more dramatic down here. Um, if you look at the, the life table type data, these individuals that are there during this time period, okay, when there, there are very few individuals there, they're all immigrants. Okay? So they are basically being raised in probably higher quality habitats somewhere, flying into these habitats that they think that they might be able to breed in, but very few of them make it. So if you ban the birds and you come back the next year, you don't see those birds. The birds that you're seeing are immigrants. The, the banded birds um, are very rare. It's very rare for them to be able to survive uh, during that, that uh, on those habitats. Those habitats are what we call ecological sinks. They uh, uh, attract birds to try to attempt to live there and breed, but they generally uh, are sink populations. But grasslands are fairly easy to establish in a relatively quick period of time. So in just uh, two years later, in this study, they demonstrated a, an increase in grasshopper sparrows, uh, also northern uh, bobwhites, and dick thistles. Again, this is just the data for uh, the grasshopper sparrows. And what you can see is, once the program was initiated, look at how quickly we changed to preserve banded birds in the population. So this means the birds are staying there and they're living there, uh, becoming uh, residents successfully uh, and staying year after year with the few, less need for immigrants to come in from outside. So this is a more stable uh, uh, population with a better R, uh, a reproductive uh, value. Um, so in that grassland habitat, uh, planting of appropriate seeds, obviously, to, to grow native grasses is going to be important, but um, fire is also going to be important. Fire is a natural disturbance that is actually very important for maintaining uh, quality habitat for many species. Historically, fire burned uh, half of the U.S. continent, uh, uh, continental U.S., every one to uh, 12 years. Oftentimes, due to just lightning strikes and contiguous forests that would spread. But there is evidence that Native Americans would use fire to clear out and make a more um, um, open habitat, which is easier for them to um, move around in. Uh, but also, it had some benefits associated with uh, the production of, of uh, certain food stores uh, and, and wildlife that they uh, relied on. So grasslands are very important in those sparrows studies uh, for shrikes to maintain open habitat to reduce the, the growth of woody, uh, brushy vegetation. It keeps it a grassland, fire does. The picture I'm showing here is a controlled fire that recently went through part of the Angelina National Forest. Um, and this is incredibly important tool for managing these uh, 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 pine forest savannas. So again, you have mature pines, but the understory is preserved as primarily grasses. Um, so this is a requirement for red cockaded woodpeckers, as I mentioned. 
But again, by maintaining it for that species, you're benefiting also two species that have declining populations, the Bachman sparrow, uh, which nests in those, those grasses, and brown-headed nuthatches that we've been seeing. Brown-headed nuthatches um, are not nearly as habitat-specific as red-cracted woodpeckers, but we've demonstrated that, that yes, burned habitats with open understories, uh, they show much lower nest predation rates than those that um, uh, are ecological sinks that do have those mid-stories. So by regulating the habitat uh, with fire for red carcated woodpeckers, you're benefiting other species as well. And this is just uh, other bird species, but there are mammals, um, there are uh, reptiles, the Louisiana pine snake, for example, um, and lots and lots of plants uh, that are benefiting by this habitat uh, manipulation using fire. Same thing for the oak scrub habitat in Florida. We talked about previously, um, the Florida scrub jay is, is very habitat specific. They have to have, they live in uh, oak scrub habitat that has to be burned uh, at regular intervals. Uh, it becomes too thick. They suffer too much nest predation in, in those uh, types of habitats and they'll abandon it. Now, the intensity and the regularity of firemen as a management tool will depend on the habitat and its, its fire history, um, both long-term as far as what, what uh, fire frequency was kind of natural for that habitat, uh, but also more recently, what is its history of being burned and not burned, what are the fuel levels, um, so an area that hasn't been burned for a long time may have to go in and do some mechanical prep, some, some um, herbicides to kill off uh, the material underneath, and then burn it. But because there's going to be a big root stock associated with uh, some of the woody vegetation, it may need to be burned fairly regularly um, initially, and then, uh, then maybe less uh, frequent burning would be required in the future. Um, Forest habitats probably going to need less uh, frequent burns than grassland habitats. Uh, grassland habitats are probably going to need to be burned at a much more frequent uh, level. And again, just to kind of demonstrate the importance of, of fire habitat for the Florida scrub jay, you see that in this one uh, research plot from the uh, late 70s to uh, through the 80s, the number of scrub jays in this area dropped until fire was introduced uh, as a management tool. And then you see that immediately after the fire, the population started to recover in this area. Um, and this, this tells us um, that you, you can see that after, oh, what is it? Since 90 of the fire, and then again about uh, 98, 99, 99, you start seeing it drop off again. So about every 10 years is when you really need to be burning the, the scrub in Florida. All right. Um, it turns out that certain birds are doing quite well in adapting to urban habitats. Um, some, some of the species that do so include ospreys. This is an osprey that you can see is built a nest on uh, an electrical pole. A nice platform, nice safe against uh, predators. Red-tailed hawks will do the same thing. Vultures will use human structures. I'm just to my left here, about uh, 150 yard. I've got an old barn that has um, two, um, uh, well, it has a black vulture nest in it, and they've been nesting in there for, for decades uh, now. Crows are also very common, actually doing well in urban settings. Canada geese, their populations have increased uh, so much so, and they love golf courses. People that manage golf courses hate Canada geese because they are very attracted uh, to uh, the vegetation um, uh, associated with uh, foraging uh, on those golf courses, and they're, they just make a mess. Um, um, so golfers don't like Canada geese. Brown-headed nuthatches, it turns out in some of our studies locally, um, predation rates of brown-headed nuthatches are actually lower in urban settings than they are in more natural rural habitats. And this is due almost entirely to a reduction in snake predation. Um, 
urban habitats just are not a very good habitat for most snakes. People uh, see snakes and they kill them. Roads are not good for snakes, um, which which is unfortunate. But the brown-headed nuthatches actually benefit from that because uh, net predation by things like black rat snakes is their number one problem. And so in urban settings, fewer snakes, more success. Um, Eastern bluebirds um, are doing well in urban settings because of the frequency at which people put up bluebird boxes uh, for nesting and probably also benefiting in the same ways that the brown-headed nuthatches do by reduced uh, predation by snakes. This is a cooper's hawk. Uh, cooper's hawk and sharp-shinned hawks are excipiter hawks which specialize on eating other birds. So their numbers are actually increasing greatly in urban settings because people put up bird feeders. If you put up a bird feeder to feed things like sparrows and chickadees and titmice and woodpeckers and, and uh, other passerines, it's just a matter of time before you also start feeding a cooper's hawk uh, or a sharp shinned hawk. These exhibitor hawks uh, are clearly going after um, the birds that you're attracting to your feeder. So they are benefiting from that. Peregrine falcons have been introduced into urban areas uh, to control populations of uh, rock doves, uh, pigeons. And they nest on skyscrapers and on bridges, um, and their population have become stable in many of these areas. After the reduction of the use of the ban of, of DDT in the U.S., uh, the uh, bald eagles uh, have increased greatly in population. This is just data from the Christmas bird count in Wisconsin, but that same trend has existed throughout. And in Texas, um, bald eagles are actually fairly common now uh, in, in, in many parts of Texas. Um, from central Texas all the way here in east Texas, you go to Rayburn, you're going to see bald eagles. Um, Lake Nacogdoches, you frequently see uh, bald eagles. Lake uh, Nacogdoches. Uh, bald eagles are very common. I was lucky enough this summer, uh, this last summer, to um, drive uh, through the uh, Grand Canyon and see uh, California condors. Their um, populations had dropped to zero birds in the wild in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, the populations had dropped initially because of consumption of carcasses that had uh, been sh you know, shot by hunters and they, they ran off before the, the hunter could get them, just you know, uh, didn't track them. Uh, and the condors would eat the carcasses but also would consume the lead bullets. Um, and this led to lead poisoning, uh, killing off uh, the, many of the condors. So the remaining individuals were moved to captivity and started a captive breeding program, and you can see that that captive breeding program greatly increased uh, the number of birds, but still we're talking about very few birds. Um, so by 1999, uh, we were just uh, you know around 150 birds total, many of those captive, with then releasing some individuals back into the wild. Um, and, this is a very good positive trend, but it's a slow, slow bit of progress, again, because this is a species whose life history is such that there's delayed maturation of individuals, uh, small clutch sizes. Um, so these are the type of things, you know, it's, we're not talking about grasshopper sparrows here. Um, their life history, just by its own nature, is going to make this a, a slower process of recovery. I did look up the uh, data for this. It, now there, we do have over 300 in the wild and over 500 as the total population, in, in, uh, including captive individuals. So historically, there's been a lot of uh, decrease, uh, of, of, of ex increase in extinctions of birds associated with islands, but it's still a problem today. Uh, so here are very small islands associated with the Gulf of California and Baja Peninsula um, showing that on many of these islands the white dots are where uh, there's been localized extinction of uh, seabirds due to uh, the introduction of mammals like goats 
uh, which again can destroy the nest directly and just reduce the vegetation associated with the nest uh, to, to make predation more likely. But rats, um, um, in some cases snakes as well, being introduced to these islands uh, has led to some major problems. Um, those with the, the um, dots are where we've actually lost endemic species, so had uh, endemic species extinction or at least subspecies where there may be another population uh, elsewhere um, that, that could recolonize this uh, if the habitat was restored to a not nice quality, meaning you get to get rid of those predators. Um, there are some islands though that uh, are still predator free and have healthy populations. And so we need to get the predators off these others, these mammals, these uh, exotic species that don't belong on those islands to return these seabird populations uh, when, when there are still alternatives and we haven't had a localized extinction of, of an entire species. Um, I've known people that have, have done some of these removal pro programs and sometimes it involves using traps, sometimes it involves using, uh, as, as one uh, friend of mine, he was at a talk talking about removal of goats, removal of goats in this island. This one woman said, well, you, you keep talking about goat removal. How did you do this? And this guy was a really kind of a gruff guy and a uh, big beard. And he just looked at her really uh, in the eye and he said, ma'am, we did it at uh, close range with high powered rifles without missing a beat. So sometimes that's just what it takes. But then how do you get the birds back? Uh, if there are other populations elsewhere, how do you then recruit them to this island? It turns out using decoys um, and vocalizations, recorded vocalizations of these in combination, can attract real birds to these islands, just like uh, duck hunters would, would do. Um, these birds tend to um, follow dominant individuals and they basically say, oh, that looks popular. There are already a bunch of individuals there. I'll go ahead and join that group as well. So you're tricking them into thinking that there is already an established population and it really does work. I've been lucky enough to help uh, establish, I did very little of this, but um, a, a population of blue-tailed bee eaters in a, a, uh, one end of an island uh, by use of decoys. So Clearly, habitat loss, habitat degradation is the main issue associated with most uh, uh, populations of, of birds that are showing declines. Overhunting, though, overfishing associated with the food supply um, that, that, say, a seabird would need has also been a problem. The pet trade directly has taken some birds out of natural population and, and uh, reduced their ability to maintain themselves. This has been particularly a problem with uh, parrots. Um, but even passerines, you go through some uh, uh, markets in Latin America and you can find um, lots of songbirds. So um, this was a big issue, I don't know if it is anymore, with painted buntings, for example. Uh, the pet trade, they're beautiful birds and uh, people would catch the, capture them uh, for the pet trade. And then just flying into structures, uh, artificial structures. We talked about how urban settings can benefit certain species, but uh, birds uh, colliding with windows of houses, and then also roadkill uh, as you're driving down the road uh, and you hit birds with your car. Um, that is reducing certain numbers of birds. Um, the biggest one of this, this area, though, besides second only to habitat loss, is outdoor pets, particularly cats. We now have lots of very good data. Uh, uh, Pete Mara... Uh, has really led the way on this. He's got a, a very good book, and you can find YouTube interviews with Pete, um, where he talks about cats. Well, many people love cats. If you have a cat, keep it in the house. Um, these things do, are incredibly efficient predators, and when you let them outside, they kill huge numbers of birds every year. So... Um, Pete's work is, has documented that we could be losing uh, 2.4 billion birds a year 
and it's not just birds, uh, many more small mammals and uh, small uh, herps, like anoles. Um, cats are just ecological disasters. So I've had cats in the past, but if you have a cat, just keep it in the house. Uh, it's, it's one of the, the easiest things you can do to preserve wildlife. And lastly, um, ecotourism is a huge tool in providing funding uh, and education for conservation issues. Uh, viewing and feeding birds is one of the fastest growing uh, avocations or hobbies in the U.S. and it adds billions of dollars to the U.S. economy uh, and taxes associated with that can be used. Uh, for example, like binocular sales uh, can be used to, to preserve uh, habitats so hopefully I've got you interested in doing birding, not only from a scientific point of view, but just as travel. Um, I hope that you're, you're enjoying this and it's something that you keep up uh, throughout your life um, and, and spread that, that the love of birding uh, to other people uh, for uh, the good that uh, it'll do uh, for the preservation of these species and, and, and a greater appreciation of nature. All right, well, that is uh, it for the semester. Um, I really, this is my favorite class to teach, and it's killed me a little bit, uh, particularly not to be able to go out in the labs with you guys. Um, and I'm sitting here listening to uh, both, literally I'm hearing a, a red-eyed vireo and uh, one of the probably the last of the yellow-throated uh, vireo singing. Here pretty soon. Um, indigo buntings everywhere. Uh, I know painted buntings. I haven't seen one yet. Painted buntings are here. Um, I'm sure there are rose-breasted grosbeaks flying around here. I've seen uh, blue grosbeaks, um, and the warblers are going to be spectacular starting this week. Um, if you are still in Nacogdoches and you can head out to Pecan Park, usually. The last week of April and the, the uh, first week of May is the prime time to see warblers in Pecan Park. Um, it's on a good day, might be able to get 15, 10, 15 species just of warblers in our little bitty Pecan Park. Um, so American Red Starts, um, Wilson's Warblers, Blackburnian Warblers, yeah, it, it, it can be uh, quite wonderful. Uh, Salu uh, even Cerulean warblers uh, will occasionally get those there. and those, It's really a treat to, to see those birds. So I will probably be out there um, maintaining uh, appropriate social distancing. But if you can make it out to the park, I definitely encourage you to do that. Or wherever you are, um, try to find some nice uh, hardwood stands in, in, uh, early in the morning um, and see... If you, you hear a bird that you don't recognize, really track it down and, and see if you can get a good look at it um, because this is prime warbler migration time. All right. Thanks a lot.